I now give you Rick Judd. Thank you Rick. very much. Thank you, Rebecca. So um, we'll be talking about uh, vegetable gardening fall through winter. Uh, I got very interested in winter gardening kind of as a result of working over in South Jersey, uh, my office area was contingent or adjacent to several hundred acres of farming land. And I always enjoyed watching the spinach crops being put in in the fall and having the gardeners harvest some of the spinach crop in the fall and then letting the crop go through the winter and into the following spring and getting some harvests in the following spring. I thought that was a great thing to do, so I tried that in my home garden and it works out very nicely. I had my fall spinach crop go through the winter into the following spring. So that is a way of expanding your backyard gardening. I've always thought that uh, backyard gardening was very important because every pound of food that you grow is a pound that never would have been there if you weren't a backyard gardener. So let's go on with the presentation. We'll talk about the topics. We'll be talking about fall crops. Some are some like it cool, some like it cold. Uh, we're talking basically about the hardiness of vegetables in regards to the cold weather. And then we will talk about gardening through the winter with these crops. And finally, talking about pest protection. A number of the families of crops that grow well in the winter are also highly sought after by pests and uh, their types of, of uh, pests that, that tend to want to destroy your crop before you get a chance to eat it. Okay, many familiar uh, crops uh, are available for growth through the winter time. And uh, I thank God for that because let's face it, people need to eat. And it's wonderful that you can grow your own sustenance and take part in the great circle of life from that point of view. Many of the crops that you'll be growing in the winter can be seeded from, started from seed directly outside in your soil. Some need to be started inside and then transplanted in the garden later or purchased from a nursery and transplanted later. The flavor uh, of many of these crops improve over the cool season. I really get a kick out of how nature has made its uh, presence known by somehow these hardy vegetables have learned how to store energy as starches and when the cool weather comes along, they get triggered and the starches begin to turn into sugars. And those sugars act as a natural antifreeze to allow the crop to grow in a much cooler environment. I've actually had spinach in my garden where my remote sensing thermometer indicates minus four degrees Fahrenheit. So these guys are really able to handle the cool season and especially in our relatively easy winters here, uh, it, that allows us to extend our season greatly. Another plus of cool season gardening and cold season gardening is to reduce the enemy of the crops. The cool and cold season crops, their enemy is heat. So once the heat comes along, then they tend to bolt and throw up uh, flower stock and turn to seed and, and everything's ruined. So obviously when you garden into the winter, the heat is not, a, not gonna generate uh, uh, any kind of bolting. And finally, let's face it, uh, many pests are eliminated in the winter season. Uh, you don't see too many cabbage butterflies flying around in the middle of January. But you've got to approach 
the fall and winter season, the cool seasons with the right cast of characters. Okay? You won't be growing tomatoes outside in the middle of January. You've got to have the right vegetables in place to have your winter garden. The next two slides I consider worth the price of admission, basically. They are vegetables, two vegetable charts of a cool or hardy vegetables and very hardy vegetables. So how to use this chart? Because this is the chart that would be a, a recommended asset to you growing crops throughout fall and into the winter. So the first column on the left is the actual vegetable itself. Okay, many are very familiar to you. The second column is very important also because it tells you what family those vegetables are in. The brassica family is a very predominant family in this cool season. And there are certain pests that attack the brassicas and won't even bother with other types of vegetables. So this, this family name column is very important. And finally, to use this, go into this column here, which is the growth mode. And if you see direct sow in that column, then that means that the vegetable you're referring to can be directly sown outside in the soil at that particular time of year. So for example, let's take beets. Beets can be directly sown in your soil outside in mid-July through mid-August. That would be the recommended time for a harvest late in the fall. Uh, take, for example, cauliflower. I would recommend that be planted as a transplant and that would be uh, transplanted in early August. But the, if, you, if you want to start the seedling, the transplant seedling yourself, you would start the seed inside in mid-June as six weeks later, it would be available to transplant outside. Or you could simply purchase that from a nursery to plant directly outside in early August. Uh, uh, something such as broccoli could be directly sown or transplanted. If you directly sow it, then you would look in this column and you would directly sow it in mid-July through mid-August. If you transplant it, you would start the seed inside around mid-June and transplant it outside after six weeks of growth in early August, or simply, you know, once again, purchase it from a nursery and plant it in early August. The second page, this second table, use exactly the same as the first table. One of the things that is interesting, you will once again notice many vegetables are common, very familiar to you. There, are, there may be a couple, Claytonia and Mosh, two totally different groups, families of vegetables, which can be, which are very cold hardy and can be planted and enjoyed in this area. So this is called season extension and we're extending the fall season into the winter. And some of these crops will actually grow all the way through winter into the following spring. And that's where you get a tremendous bonus because when the light starts strengthening again, and the crops start growing again uh, in the springtime, you will be harvesting spinach, say, in early March, late February, and that gives you a tremendous jump on the season. Now, you can treat winter gardening in a couple of ways. One is using the garden as a giant refrigerator, where you simply, uh, this is mostly for root crops, etc you will wait till the, the weather gets nice and cold and then you put a mulch layer on top about a six inch mulch layer to help to thermally shock absorb okay it helps to insulate the garden and you won't every freeze thaw cycle you won't be necessarily heaving the vegetable out of the ground or damaging it in some way 
The other way to use winter gardening is just allow cold loving crops to continue to grow through the winter. I've listed a few here, but obviously from the table, you will also, the tables, you'll also see them. Things like uh, Asian greens can be done that way, spinach, as we've mentioned, Brussels sprouts uh, and uh, cabbage family members. And as the winter goes on, you can harvest them occasionally, but then you wait until uh, the uh, springtime comes for an added bonus if the plants make it through the winter time. I want to, as I mentioned, spinach was my first indicator of how this could be done. So we will go over uh, that. We'll take a number of uh, exposures through the winter time of a couple of rows of lettuce, excuse me, a couple of rows of spinach and watch how they progress through the winter. But oftentimes I will uh, put especially if it's the brassica family, I will put row covers, I will support row covers directly over the vegetables, primarily to protect them from insect predation. In our area, with the warm winters, it's not really necessary to, if you plant the right vegetables to protect them with warmth. Oftentimes I will drape these row covers over rabbit wire arches or put them over some kind of hoop tunnel arch. We'll go through this a little bit later. Finally, I want just to make a comment about the growth rate through the winter time. The sun dips below 10 hours a day between about mid-November and late January, our area. So between that, that month and a half of time, excuse me, two and a half months of time, we're getting very weak sunlight for a very short duration of, of day. In addition, because of course, because of the angle of sun, it's very, very weak. So your growth during that period of time will be sustained, that the plant will sustain, but the growth will be greatly cut back. Not quite suspended animation, but very slow growth through that period of time, mid-November through late January. So here I'm taking you these, with these two rows of spinach through that very period of time and on to the following spring. This is a shot from about the middle of November, November 19th. We're gonna be going through the year the winter of the year of 2012 through 2013. Here I have rabbit wire arches. I've got them, I've got butt cut uh, lumber on the ends to prevent rabbits from getting in. And we simply drape a row cover over the arches. If we continue further and I pulled the row cover back, you can see it back here. But this is the middle of December. You can see the plants are doing beautifully. Uh, if anything, they've probably grown just a little bit and they're remaining their nice verdant green color. The first week of January in 2013, the plants are doing fine, probably thickening up a little, very, uh, however, slow growth. At this point, you might be able to get out, sneak a couple of leaves in if you wanted to throw them into your salad, but Certainly, as we allow this, these spinaches to continue through the middle of January, if this is what they look like. I'm just showing you that I, I'm not throwing your ringer here. This is a, a thermometer that is put through the row cover so that you can look, see the temperature. And uh, on the 18th of January, 2013, at quarter of five in the evening, it was just beginning to dip below 30 degrees. And obviously as the winter continued on, excuse me, as the evening continued on, the temperature got a lot colder. At the end of January, once again, this is the end of the very low light period. This is what the spinach looks like. Growth now, the sun is getting a lot stronger and the growth will start being enhanced. So as we move through the middle of February, this is what you get. 
you could actually probably take cuttings from your spinach now, just cutting the outer leaves, leaving the core inward to uh, provide more leaves in the future. Like a kind of like the shark, uh, the teeth of a shark. You you cut the outer leaves and the inner core replaces them with the inner core now generating outer leaves. The 10th of March, doing fine. Growth going along very nicely. Certainly cuttings would be uh, well in order here. And finally, uh, in on the 9th of April, I've removed the row covers because very shortly, uh, these things have actually grown and pushed the row covers up, uh, upward. They pushed the arches upward. And very soon I will be making the final harvest as the warmth of the spring is will be making the spinach bolt probably in a week or two. Once that's done, then a couple of weeks later, we'll be getting ready for the warm season. Your tomatoes go in, etc. cetera. Uh, just to show you that uh, spinach isn't the only thing that can make it through the winter. Here I have some beautiful broccoli rob. On the 10th of March, I had a nice broccoli rob feed, at rapini, and uh, this turned out to be excellent that winter. Uh, this is a photo that Lila Muir, one of our beloved gardeners, uh, master gardeners, uh, took of her backyard garden. Uh, so she since has moved out to Washington where the growing parameters are, are totally different. Washington, uh, excuse me, Washington State. But here you see on the 7th of January, Lila likes to, she liked to cut hula hoops in half and create these kind of short hoops over which she put a little bit of uh, rebar, uh, thin rebar, and then threw the row covers directly over them. You see some beautiful kale growing here. So anybody who loves Caldo Verde soup, <laughs> this, is, this is a big plus to be able to go out in the middle of winter and cut these. You also see some beets over here. The nice part about beets, well, the interesting part about beets is as the cool weather comes, the chlorophyll gets uh, leaves the leaves and you end up with red leaves, but the, uh, but the crop is totally edible and, and wonderful. Here are some Brussels sprouts that I had in my backyard. Uh, I love this. I call this the Brussels sprouts the day after Christmas, anyone? And uh, this is a, Brussels sprouts are a very long maturing vegetable, about 120 days for Long Island and Proof. So these guys were planted about middle of July, and they were put under a row cover, an arc, uh, a low hoop tunnel row cover, and they're producing nice Brussels sprouts. Uh, as a matter of fact, I went out and unscrewed a number of them from the stem and ate them raw. Not a big Brussels sprout lover, but they're nice. That time of year, they're nice, even if you eat them raw. Here I have a couple of mystery vegetables. Uh, if you saw the second chart and I kind of was underlining mosh and claytonia, you probably have guessed these are a couple of very hardy greens, salad greens. This is mosh right here, sometimes referred to as corn salad. And this is claytonia right here, sometimes referred to as minor le miner's lettuce. The mosh is a highly sought after green in uh, French salads, they'll pay like 13 bucks a, a pound for them. The Claytonia is a green that grows wild in the Pacific Northwest. It's called miner's lettuce because miners and railroad workers used to seek it out for its high vitamin C content. For miners and railroad workers, that was how to protect themselves against the diseases of vitamin C deficiency, much the same as the English sailors uh, ate limes to prevent scurvy. You, you can see here, this shot being from the 1st of February, the tremendous hardiness of these. These were not even covered with roll covers. And you can see they were totally covered with snow, which actually acts as an insulator to a certain degree. And uh, when the snow, the snow melted first on this garden, and uh, reveal the vegetables. And here, of course, the snow is still uh, around the garden. And so you can see it was, a, uh, it was a winter worth its name. 
Uh, now I will talk about coop tunnel construction. And here's where we will use a supported row cover. In the fall, you have to have protection for your brassica crops because there are a couple of very nasty pests that will eat them right down to zip. And uh, so we will talk about making a low hoop tunnel and then uh, how that can be used to protect them against a couple of major pests. So the, this hoop tunnel is put onto a bed that is four feet wide. Most people, when they have raised beds, they think of the raised beds with the lumbers on the lumber on the sides, and they're four foot by eight foot. Or if you have a, a an in-ground bed, four feet wide by however long you want. Four foot wide is a wonderful bed dimension because you can reach all the vegetables from either side of the bed without having to track through the bed and compressing the soil and ruining the soil structure. So a couple of the important items to use on a four foot wide bed, we're, we're gonna be getting some 18 inch steel stakes of one half inch outer diameter and 10 foot wide PV, excuse me, 10 foot long PVC pipe of one half inch inner diameter. And I think you're, you're probably gathering now that pipe will sleeve over the stake. So this is a basically one of the hoops. These are the 18 inch uh, steel stake, one half inch outer diameter, and this is the 10 foot PVC pipe, which is one half inch inner diameter. The reason the, the uh, hoop or the pipe is already bent is because it's been used before. This type of hoop tunnel construction can be moved all over your garden as desired. When you get, when you start constructing the bed, I'll show you shortly, you're, you will be putting 18 inch steel stakes in it at the one end of the eight foot long bed. Okay, 12 inches go below the soil, six inches on top. And there'll be another stake put directly opposite that four feet away on the other side of the bed. And then you take your uh, PVC pipe with the O-rings on it. Uh, I, in the original slide, you can see there were O-rings about halfway up one side, two up at the top, and one halfway down the other side. And you'll see the use of those shortly. But you sleeve the pipe over one of the stakes and then bend it very slowly until you can sleeve it over the top of the other one. This is a bit of a daunting thing. When you're, when, when you're bending that, you're going to think for a while that this thing just may explode and end up uh, in pieces flying up to the flying 10 feet high. As long as you bend it slowly, it will actually uh, bend over and you can sleeve it over, like I say, the stake on the other side. So you put one at one end of the garden, you put another hoop four feet away at the middle of the garden and the final hoop at the far end of the garden. So you have hoops every four feet. Okay, now if you, you have a 16 foot long garden, just continue to put hoops every four feet down the length of the garden. Okay. But that, once again, that garden bed, if you have a 16 foot long garden bed, hopefully it is four feet wide. On the O-rings, which act as a bit of a shelf, you put a stake, an eight foot long stake. This is a tomato stake. Um, any sharp edges, either put tape over them or like slide a, a iced tea, say like a 12 ounce iced tea bottle over the end of it so that it doesn't lead to sharp surfaces. When this thing sits on this shelf, then you either take zip ties to secure it or you use just yarn by making figure eights or under the bottom of the uh, hoop and over the top of the stake. You can then just secure it and tie it off. 
If you use uh, zip ties, make sure any sharp edges, once again, you, you have tape on them so that they won't rip the row cover. Here's my cheapo backyard version. The other one was a nice Cadillac version with the side uh, side rods, uh, which is something you would use in the demo garden. In my backyard garden, it's, it's strictly about function. I didn't put the side arms in there. I just have a, a ridge line over the top. You can see that the row covers are put over the two hoops. This is a four foot long by four foot wide garden bed. You put uh, butt cut lumber to keep the ends from flying up and you get large or extra large uh, cl clips from like uh, staples, etc., and a smooth edged and you simply clip the row cover onto the arch with that. Okay. This incidentally is the, uh, the hoop house that that Brussels sprouts that I showed you earlier uh, was under. It, it started out as about a four inch high transplant and ended up what I showed you at the end of uh, December. There are a number of other four inch high transplants here, which uh, later on we'll show you how greatly they increased in size over about seven weeks. Now there was a question about row covers and, and it's a very excellent question. Row covers serve two purposes. One is to exclude insect pests and the other is to hold in and entrap heat. Depending on the environment you're using them in, you would favor the insect exclusion or the holding in of heat and uh, you would select your row cover based on that. So um, for our area, such a mild winter, a very, very thin row cover is all that's needed, okay? In other words, if they sell you what they would call an insect barrier, then that is probably allows about 90% of the light to transmit through the row cover. And the amount of heat that is held in will be minimal by comparison, okay? I watch uh, suspended thermometers under my hoop tunnels. And it's kind of funny, you can see uh, with about an LT, a light transmission of 90% row cover. As the sun is shielded from by clouds, you'll actually see the temperature dropping. It's, it's that quick. You don't want in our fall, which can lead to some very hot days, you don't want to use a very heavy row cover. So I would say in our area, use nothing that has less light transmission than 85%. And I would actually prefer to use something with a light transmission of 90% or possibly even 95% if you can get that. Therefore, you minimize the amount of heat that is retained, but you maximize the insect exclusion. Now, where would somebody use a row cover with a light transmission of 30%? This is almost like a blanket. You would use them in very harsh climates. I'm saying very upward parts of the United States and up into Canada, that type of thing, perhaps. That there a very small amount of the light comes through, but it does heat up and does sustain the garden, but an awful lot of that heat is retained for hours uh, later. Okay. So that is the, I hope that clarified the question on row covers. Thank I you. Had, okay. I had put some vegetables out. Uh, this is actually, this actually was a spring crop that I put in on the 23rd of March. I put the vegetables out, but I hadn't, even though they were hardy vegetables, I hadn't hardened them off. I started them from seed and hadn't hardened them off appropriately. So because there was an impending storm coming, I decided just to throw some row covers over the the rabbit wire arches and it snowed on top. It basically kept the snow off them. Not so much the snow you worry about, but I just don't like to have uh, fro uh, ice forming on the leaves because if ice forms, uh, it's, it can tend to kill the leaves. So under that 
uh, Roke, uh, under that tunnel that I just uh, showed you in, the, in my backyard, which was labeled 11 of August. These were uh, kale that were then planted. It was about a three inch to four inch high transplant and they've just exploded in size over the seven months intervening. I also, of course, have the Brussels sprouts in here and some broccoli as well, as well as some uh, uh, Chinese cabbage, et cetera. This is the broccoli that grew under the row cover. I'm, I'm gonna guarantee you that if they did not have the row cover on, there would be holes all through these beautiful broccoli leaves. Broccoli is a wonderful fall crop. Uh, I like short season, what I would call, I guess, short season broccoli. There are some broccolis that are available that take 70 days to mature. I prefer to, to use the ones that are in the 50s, okay? So this is Bonanza, a beautiful head of broccoli with side shoots after harvest side shoots. Uh, it's a 55-day broccoli. I highly recommend it. Uh, Pac-Man is another beauty. That's about a 57-day broccoli. We tried one in the vegetable demo garden before the pandemic hit, which is called Blue Wind. And that's a 50-day broccoli that looked very good. There's also a much smaller heading broccoli called De Chico. It is a, an Italian heirloom and it forms about three inch uh, diameter heads and that's a 48 day broccoli. So broccoli is a great thing to grow in the cooler weather. Now the final section of this is gonna be about pests. Very important if you're growing brassica crops to be able to take care of the pests because they will destroy the crops if you aren't vigilant. So, so one, one of the um, major offenders are the, are the cabbage worms, okay? The cabbage worms are one of the major offenders of all brassica crops. I don't care whether you're growing cabbage crops, which are, are mem one member of the brassica family, and or whether you're growing mustard, mustards, okay? It's a very wide ranging family and the cabbage worms will find their way to all members of that family if they're desperate enough. By putting roll covers on, you totally minimize cabbage worms. And the reason for that is that the white butterflies that fly around lay eggs on your brassicas. And by laying eggs on your brassicas, they hatch and then ultimately form the cabbage worm. So that is very important to eliminate that flying pest using row covers. The other thing to ensure benefit, a little added insurance, is to plant small nectar bearing flowers to attract beneficial insects. Those oftentimes can take the form of white alyssum or yarrow, both small nectar bearing flowers. Also, uh, your umbelliferae herbs are excellent at that, your fennels, your dills, your coriander, parsley, things like Queen Anne's lace, very, very valuable. The small nectar bearing flowers will attract beneficial insects. The harlequin bug is probably public offender number two, as far as your brassica crops go. And they are a uh, stink bug. And in addition, once again, the added insurance of small nectar bearing flowers, as, as we've mentioned. Once you've taken, okay. yes, Question about row covers and these. So do you put the row covers on at the same time you plant the crops? Yeah, or very shortly afterwards, because if you don't, the insects will find their way. I've Sometimes if you, if you even wait a week, they'll find their way to, the, to your crop. So I would put them on directly when I planted them. And I have two people who are asking, um, how do you let the good bugs in and keep the bad bugs out? No need to keep the good bugs in if you don't have any bad bugs in there, okay? Your, your, prob your problem is if you don't get that row cover on fast enough and then you put the bad bugs get in and then you put the row cover on and it keeps all the good bugs out, right? It, it's, either, it's either right from the beginning or forget it because once you put those row covers on, 
your, you know, uh, your bad bugs and good bugs are excluded. Okay. Now the only, so I call these guys airborne. These, uh, your, this is your airborne protection. Your infantry are slugs. Okay, they can get in under the row cover, so that creates a little bit of a problem. And you have to deal with them with a beer saloon. That's my favorite way. You can pick them off, but I prefer to deal with them with a beer saloon, which is simply if you eat um, cream cheese or butter, you know, you know they come in tubs. And when you're done with the product, simply bury the tub deep enough so that the lip of the tub is level with the surface of the soil and then fill that with beer and then the slugs will automatically come to it oh, by the way put that outside <laughs> put it outside your row cover i did just i enjoy it best that way and they will find their way to that before they get in under the row cover and then they will uh, go in they will drown every couple of days you toss that out put it back in to its position and reload with beer. After probably about four or five cycles, you'll see the slugs will be greatly depleted if not totally eliminated and, and then you can stop the process. So the other uh, group uh, of vegetables were the quinopods, which beets, chard, and spinach, and the asteraceae vegetables, which were uh, like lettuce and endive. Uh, they attract a totally different set of pests. The harlequin bugs and the cabbage worms wouldn't even waste their time with them, but the slugs will. So once again, uh, beer saloon take care of them, okay? And then rabbits, of course, rabbit wires will exclude those, uh, will exclude rabbits, okay? Let's go over just a few slides. The, the rogues gallery first, this is an imported cabbage worm. It's about a one inch long velvety green uh, caterpillar. And uh, you can see it's handiwork. These guys eat voraciously. This is a collared leaf and he's well getting on to destroying it. Uh, here's what I call cousin or cuz. This is the cross striped cabbage worm and they will do the same thing. Uh, another slightly creamier, I guess, butterfly, but the same idea, the white butterfly, and, and these guys will eat your crop down. This was in the year 2014. We had in the vegetable demo garden some nice red cabbage. Pull the outer leaves back, and to our surprise, or not surprise, it was loaded with cabbage worms. This was a um, cross striper here, and a couple of imported cabbage worms there. So you get them off, you clean up the frass, which is ultimately falls down to the bottom junction of the cabbage. Cut that off and you're ready to enjoy a nice red cabbage. This is a harlequin bug. Harlequin bugs are a type of stink bug. They're brightly colored. I think harlequin was a character in uh, a Shakespearean novel brightly colored as this guy is. Uh, orange and black. They lay eggs that are also very intriguing. Uh, the egg is zebra-like in color. White egg with concentric black circles going down it. So if you see any of them, get them off as well. These are some of the good guys. Small nectar-bearing flowers, alyssum. This is a surfid fly. The Small mouth parts are needed. Uh, uh, they will need small nectar bearing flowers. That's why they're needed. Just so small nectar bearing flowers is an important thing to bring into your garden. This is a margined soldier beetle. Same idea on uh, fern leaf yarrow, small nectar bearing flower. This is a hoverfly, another beneficial on yellow yarrow. It's common leaf yarrow great to attract them into the garden. Also, much faster than I could photograph, there's parasitic wasps flying on and off these things. Whenever I got my camera ready, they were off, so I didn't get a picture of them. But they parasitize both the eggs and the pest itself and are very valuable to your garden. So in summary, we talked about fall crops, we talked about when to plant and how to plant and how you can, how you can control pests. 
and we also talked about season extension into the winter and then some, and in other words, into the following spring for a number of these vegetables. We'll take questions. I'm gonna hold, hold this slide up, however, uh, as recommended reading, uh, year-round vegetable gardening, uh, very simple. If you get the cold, the winter gardening down, most of us think the summer gardening is very easy. And as a result, if you get winter gardening down, you basically are a year-round gardener. Nikki Jabour's book here is an excellent resource. Elliot Coleman's book here is also good. And then particularly this Rodale Press publication talks about natural insect and disease control. Thanks for coming. I enjoyed, the, uh, enjoyed giving the presentation to you folks. Very enjoyable. <laughs>